Good morning, afternoon, evening, or nighttime, wherever you are joining us uh, for our third episode um, on this whole Digitally Genius School series. Today, um, we've got another really interesting panel of experts um, from this time North America, but also from the UK, talking to you about hybrid learning, specifically from a technical point of view, and sharing with you some best practice and learnings. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Conte, who's the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction at Valley Stream School District 24. Hello, Lisa, welcome. Hello, everyone. Excellent. And with her, we have also Mark um, Honorato, Director of Instructional Tech and Data Administrator, also from Valley Stream District 24. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Very nice to have you. And Thank then you. we also have Chris O'Malley, Director of Marketing Worldwide Education and Collaboration Technology, Internet of Things for the Intel Group. Hello, Chris. <laughs> now I'm going to cough right on well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm looking forward to today. I'm um, hoping Wolfgang has some uh, great questions for us. Me too. I hope so. Who knows? Uh, and finally, we have Mark, the uh, ICT evangelist, who is supporting and always there by my side. Good evening, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, great to be on the Digitally Genius School uh, series again. Really looking forward to the conversations today. Thank you for having me again, Wolfgang. Very welcome. Right, so to kick things off, I think um, I'd just like to quickly talk to you a little bit about my or our interpretation, um, probably more than maybe our because everybody is different, about what hybrid learning means, just so we set the, the, the field and the tone a little bit, the scene. And from an education point of view, and I think over the last 20 months or so, there have been very different interpretations of what hybrid learning is. And I think it's important for us to remember that hybrid learning is of course a combination of things that happen both in the classroom and at home, but at the same time also can happen within the classroom or within the school scenario where you have students within the classroom and students outside of the classroom. So hybrid learning doesn't necessarily have to always mean they're at home and at school. It could also be in different spaces within the school or different spaces even within a classroom. So I think from that point of view, we'll get right to it. And um, I'd like to have you start, Chris, on a little bit of something that I'm wondering. You've got a senior role at Intel, as the audience just heard, and you must have seen and have some really good insight and macro views of how technology impacts schools at large. So what do you see as being some of the best approaches to hybrid learning that you've discovered and seen? Got it. So I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to reference what you, you know, I'd like to talk to virtual learning first, and then in class learning, and then hybrid, because um, I had I had two daughters in high school in the midst of this. So when the pandemic first started, it was pure virtual. So our kids were sitting in the office, which is actually why I've been relegated to the basement for most of the pandemic. But I had two daughters in all my offices doing pure hybrid and a pure virtual. And that worked. You know, the teacher was, you know, somehow on cam, like a webcam like this, like I am here. But it worked reasonably well. And then they went back into school and it was traditional. And that worked you know, like a traditional, it worked well. But then when we started the the, the quarantine process and there was 14 day quarantines and then initial and then seven day quarantines and you'd literally have 50% of the class in, in the class, 50% at home. That's when, at least at our school district, everything fell apart. They didn't have video in the classroom. So the teacher, or certainly didn't have cameras, the teacher would be teaching, standing up, the, the virtual students who were at home had no ability to see anything. So what they stopped doing in our district is they literally stopped all video and the, the students who were stuck quarantined, and sometimes it was 50%, had nothing. And then when they tried to, I'm going to try to do this, but then they would try to do virtual. They'd have in class and the teacher would be at the webcam trying to talk to students. And then they'd be going like this, trying to talk to students. And it was a bad experience for everybody. I mean, the virtual students were having a terrible time. The in-class students were having a terrible time. And it was a disaster. And, and to be frank, my school district hasn't fixed it yet. But what I've seen and what you're, you're, you're going to see with I3 and hear some of it is when you have a camera in class that allows the teacher to be able to move around, there's even the ability, you know, with I3, they have like a, a, a screen in the back where they have faces of the virtual students. You can see their expressions. You can make sure they're engaged or not. That to me is what I view 
as a really good hybrid experience. And as you mentioned, Wolfgang, it can also be a different spaces within the school. We've seen that um, as well. So that is what I really see using video in its proper format, I think. And behind the scenes for that, there's a lot of technology that Intel does work on that I can get into later. But it is from a technology standpoint, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make it seamless so you don't have stuttering. But um, I, I think that's the solution that we need to get to in the future because I don't see this environment ending anytime soon. You know, if there's another surge or if there's flu seasons, my guess is we're going to see more of the hybrid experience and we've got to tackle that from a technology perspective. Yeah, fantastic, um, Chris. And I, I agree. I think not just that it's not going to end and we're going to have some replication of this, but I think also from the experiences I certainly had in my roles at schools, there is some value in keeping some of this and really um, continuing with it and developing it because the, the, there's, a, there's a huge value that came out of all of this time as well. Um, Mark, from, from your perspective, you know, in your role, which is uh, similar to, to some of the roles that I've had, um, I can only but imagine what you've gone through, but it would be really interesting to see your perspective on this and sort of um, have, have a little bit of input from you in response to Chris. Okay. Um, I, I agree with what Chris absolutely said with um, the camera in the classroom, the camera angle. We, we had been preparing our teachers um, prior to the pandemic with training and um, I3, Google Classroom, um, even, even just touching on Google Drive itself, the entire Google Drive, we were really trying to go digital. And then the pandemic hit and everyone already had computers. We had all devices set up. I had been upgrading all bandwidth, all these things that kind of behind the scenes that people aren't necessarily thinking about that need to be taken care of first before even the training and the teachers and the students and the parents, all this back work that needs to be done leading up to it. So we, I had gotten the, the position five years uh, ago. And so we were working towards that. And then the pandemic hit. And like Chris said, the camera, what do we do? How do we do this? Where, what direction are we going to do? How are we going to how are we going to teach our, our kids that, that in our community that we, we love dearly? So one of the things that we were able to do immediately was we had the training kind of set up already. And what we went, um, we went virtual um, the next, the next week. So we, we were in on Friday and home on Monday. And what we were able to do, obviously communication was key emails and, and contacting as many people as you can, because everyone went up and running with lesson plans and we were troubleshooting kind of on the on the on the spot right on how to help everyone and how did we do that we were able to utilize our tools that we have the i3 the google the um chrome extensions that are very uh user friendly even something as chrome desktop uh extension where you can jump in i could jump in and show a teacher how to assist them and help them whatever problem they were having to troubleshoot so that was the biggest thing was troubleshooting right away for those for that first week um the, everyone had a computer for virtual but when you get back into the classroom for the hybrid model again it's it's you need a you need a camera that can rotate and do those things and we had the laptops on our computer had cameras all of them were set so we were able to have that wide angle view and see everyone and when the teachers taught their lessons to the kids in class and at home, um, they were able to see every lesson through through Jamboard or i3, whatever or whatever tool they needed to utilize to to showcase um, for for the parents at home and and the students. That's really yeah, and and I think speaking very on very similar points there, that that technology um, was one of those things that's so important to get right, and 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 the thing that maybe was not quite right all the time and and just thinking about it. and and it's great to hear mark that you took that time already beforehand to start getting prepared because i think a lot of schools around the world were just totally caught out um in in that whole sphere of technology and everything then becoming available and many companies doing their bit to try and support but of course it just it becomes very overwhelming as well um yeah. lisa oh, sorry go on mark yeah. yeah well well lisa and i and and uh dr Sturz, our superintendent of the board that was something when we were all kind of put together as like the, the, the team, we're like, we got to go digital. And this was all prior to the pandemic. So we really had something set already and um, we were able to just go further. So, so we, so it, 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 go on, Mark. Go on, Chris. chime in for a second. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to chime in one thing. One of the things that Mark, I think 
mention that I should have said that's really important is, is the critical nature of training. Um, technology is a wonderful thing, but if you give somebody technology without any training, it can be an impediment to everything. Um, and I say this, um, my wife is upstairs. She's a classroom teacher for 20 years. So when she hears me talk education, she's like, you're the technology expert, not the expert, not the education <laughs> expert. But what she told me is, you know, with flat panel displays and she used the early instantiations of it, you know, when, when you weren't trained how to use the device, she called it, um, gosh, she killed me when she said it. And Wolfgang, I apologize when you hear this, but she said, you know, those flat panel displays can be the most expensive dust collectors in the room. And I was like, but once you learn how to use the technology and train to use the technology and make it integral to your pedagogy of teaching, all of a sudden it becomes a really, really nice thing and how you bring video in, how you do all these things with it. But if you just throw it into a teacher's room and don't teach them how to use it, it, it becomes an absolute impediment to teaching. So that's all I wanted to say. And Mark brought that up and I, I was remiss in not mentioning that. No, and you're, you're absolutely, Chris. I think that's that's the key to 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 especially educational technologies, you can't just introduce it and not have support and training for, for the teachers, professional development dedicated, which actually very, very nicely leads into my question for Lisa, because that's really where what I'm interested in as well. You know, you, you're, you're the assistant superintendent, your role is specifically curriculum and instruction. And so, you know, what, having heard what you've just heard, how are your experiences and views? Um, how do they compare? And how do you see EdTech impacting schools within your district? Um, what kind of advice would you give to our viewers? Um, yeah. So as Mark had stated, um, we work as a team, our, our whole district. We had placed a strong focus and emphasis just before the pandemic, as he'd stated on um, getting techn technology up and running, making it global within our classrooms across our buildings. And we, we worked with I3 a lot to do some of that training. So that really helped us a lot as we moved in to the pandemic. We realized we had to go full remote, but we were able to do that. As he had said on Friday, we left and we started on Monday. Then after that happened, we went into hybrid instruction when we came back after the spring into the fall. And so the thing we felt was really critical, as you'd stated, Chris, was the professional development. Because our teachers, they, they understood the full remote. We had showcases of teachers teaching teachers how to do different things, but they weren't sure how do they get that collaboration, the active learning still going while using the hybrid model. So in the summers, we had a lot of professional development meetings once a week. We worked with them on you know what's synchronous learning, how to do that live stream, how to use asynchronous lessons, um, the flipped classroom, and we did a lot with active learning strategies especially with physical distancing in place, because our teachers had been getting very used to having the students use the touch screens, kind of a little different from what you were saying, Chris, where you see maybe some people thought maybe it was more like a dust collector, but in our situation, we just moved into, oh, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can have the students move things around. And then all of a sudden everything came to a screeching halt, but we didn't want that to happen. So the best thing for us was the professional development with active learning strategies that can still happen. And then within the classrooms, we also used the I360s, which were allowed us to have flexible spaces because when we had to go to hybrid, of course, we had to go to an AB model. So we had 13 students in one area. Usually we'd have like 28 in a classroom. So when we did those splits, 13 to 14 in an area, we could use our gymnasiums, we could use everything and keep everything moving forward. So I think, you know, in, in where we're at right now, we still have times um, when, you know, we have students out because of Omicron now is coming through or different um, situations that happen. We have to realize that, you know, and, and tech is, it's critical right now. It's, it's central to everything that we do. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. And, and um, I think, um, Mark, I'm going to go Mark O and Mark A from now on because we do have two Marks and I uh, I was a bit slow to to react to that. But Mark O, for, I mean, I think being involved in that district, listening to what Lisa just said, I think it'd be uh, natural for you to 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 chip in as well and and talk from your perspective on that. Absolutely. With other ed techs listening. Yeah, I, I th one of the major things that um, can go. Uh, maybe unnoticed when you're talking about the education or maybe not unnoticed is not the right word, but can can um, be a part of the solution were uh, the teachers themselves as almost they became techies in the in instructors for the parents 
you know, the, the parents are in a situation they are very unfamiliar to them as the, the whole world was. And um, the tr they were like the first step, that first level of tech, right? So the, the importance of our training helped them assist our parents. And of course, we, we created videos that we put on our website. We created booklets that we put on our webs website so that the parents could access easily. And even if something as simple as just logging into um, our our software or apps, you know, we, we made it as simple as possible where um, it was a one stop and shop with one of the programs we utilize where the, we, they sign in with their username and all of our programs would pop up. So we tried to keep it as focused and as to the point so they can get to where they need to go quickly. So none of the, oh my gosh, where are you? I can't get on, I don't know where it is, um, was taken out of the equation. And, and I think the teachers and the parents um, just should be applauded for the amount of work that was put in um, to get it so seamless w w within that, that first day and that first week, uh, we were off and running. And, and it's something we're extremely proud of here at Rally Street. So. I just wanted that's, to add that in. And, no, and I think that's really people, good too. Can I add another thing to that, Mark? That we had um, also, when we went to hybrid, we put a twist on it. Instead of just doing an A, B, Monday, we made a Monday, Thursday, and a Tuesday, Friday session. We held Wednesdays as full remote days because we wanted to make sure that everybody kept up with the technology, including the students, the teachers, and the parents, and that we could continue to give guidance through that. I think that's that's excellent. Yeah, it's 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 so important to to try and like find the best ways to to so that nobody gets overwhelmed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's so easy to forget the, the the stress people are under, even if they're comfortable with a with a technology specific. Um, Mr. Anderson, this is the the the, the quietest I've kept you, um, but you and your role have uh, have have huge insights into this as well, um, because you work with so many different schools and people. So it'd be great for you to uh, to share some of the insights you've you've had on and have. No, brilliant. Thank you for the opportunity, Wolfgang. And and it's lovely that Chris mentioned the whole idea of professional development here in the UK. We call it CPD rather than just PD. And and, and what Lisa was saying there and Mark around making sure that isn't just a one stop shop. But, you know, people can. It's about revisiting these things all of the time. Uh, so having that as, as, a, as a thing, continuing professional development is really important. I've got a little infographic to share, actually, because there's so many things that we can think about uh, when it comes to um, uh, sort of having success in these sort of settings. So, so again, thinking about these sort of things at scale, um, management of devices, having consistency of those devices is really important. And, you know, making sure you've got a, a blend there because some students will be in and some won't be. And so you need to think carefully about um, resources and making sure there's, there's opportunities for things which are synchronous, but also asynchronous. And, and, and accessibility is built in there as well. And it's not just, just about accessibility, but actually access to technology as well. It's lovely to hear about the investment that happened uh, prior to the pandemic from Mark and Lisa there, because so many schools were caught, uh, uh, caught short. So they, they hadn't planned for this. Uh, and, and again, like Mark was uh, out outlining there as well, parents and support and communications. And again, it's so, so important that, that continuing professional development is, uh, is really helpful as well. Uh, and uh, jumping to the end point there, attendance is, is really important too. Uh, and, and that's not just about being in person in the classroom, but uh, at, you know, present within within your, your Google Meet sessions or present in Teams, whatever it is you're using. And then utilizing the tools like Insights in Teams, for example, where you can see, you know, are students actually looking at the assignments? Are they engaging with it? How long are they spending on it? A, a byproduct of that as well as you can see what time students have been in, been looking at these things so you can think about that whole sort of thing around sort of mental health and well-being are students looking at these things at appropriate times of the day because uh, 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 it, it, it's so difficult isn't it and then it, the flip side there is, is about measuring it as well so you know if, if you don't measure what you're doing then then how do you know if it's been successful or not and this, this diagram uh, i share with schools uh is, is really useful because it shows you some of the pitfalls if you don't consider all these different things so if you don't monitor attendance then there's if there's knowledge gaps and if students aren't attending there are knowledge gaps if you don't measure it how do you know if you've been successful if, if staff aren't trained and supported then they're anxious 
If you don't ensure access, then it's inequality. If you don't involve the parents in all of this and train them and support them, like great to hear from Mark and, and Lisa about how they've been working with their, their parent community. Uh, it's so important. If you don't involve them, then you don't get that support, do you, from them? And, and it's so important to have that triangulation of support and wrapper of care from uh, around the child uh, uh, from, from, from the school and, and the parents as well. And then things aren't accessible, then obviously not accessible. If it's not um, uh, sort of planned for synchronous and asynchronous, then you're lacking in equality. And if you don't have a consistent approach, you know, I've, I've seen some schools, you know, uh, using you know, multiple platforms from Seesaw to Shobi to Class Dojo, all in the same school, in the same setting. And you know, that inconsistency just brings loads and loads of confusion. So it's, it's really important thing to be sort of strategic about this. And, and from the work I've done with the schools that I, that I work with, I found that having and thinking carefully about those sorts of approaches uh, as we sort of roll through the pandemic have been really helpful to make sure that we have that sort of consistency of access and, and children get the access and support and learning that they actually require and, and, and are due, aren't they? Yeah, no, I think I love I love that inter infographic, Mark. I think um, everything you've said and and like, so, as they say, a picture of photo tells a million words. And, and I think it's it's really nice to see that so clearly outlined you talking about it, because that is it really is a summative of of what's been going on and the kind of things schools need to think about schools or districts um, around that. I think it's, it's really, really, really important. Um, so I think one of the things I'd like to do is, is um, Valley Streams prepared a video for us to show how things look in real life um, with, um, yeah, within a hybrid teaching environment. So I think it'd be great for us to have a look at that. Besides that, another thing that you could do is you can share activities that you've made on, on, on your i3 or smartboard through the students' devices. And I found that one of the easiest ways to do it is to use the i3 technology app that we were trained on because they have a, you create your lessons and then they actually have a button now that they've added where you share it directly from the Google Classroom. It's just a button that says share to Google Classroom, which is really great. And then the same thing, the students, just like the Bitmoji Classroom, will go on and they can log in and then they can see the same assignment and activities that you've posted. So while students are doing it at the board with a teacher, the other people in the class can be doing it independently on their own and, you know, be involved in the lesson still, even though it's not necessarily their turn to come up to the board, which is really great, keeps them busy, and the kids love doing things on their iPads anyway, so it kind of gives them the technology and the engagement and all of that. So I have a quick video of how to do that also just to show you where the file sharing button is in the i3 technology. This is such a great added feature. I think. Yeah, yeah, you covered it randomly and it was awesome. Yeah, it used to be so much harder and now it's really, it's really easy to do. Yeah, they've added a lot of things in the i3 technology actually. They have something called like hybrid learning where like all of your lessons and things you can share onto Google Classroom or share with students directly and not through Google Classroom if you want. Um, and there are videos on the i3 website on how to do all of those things. They've really added a lot of stuff for um, distance learning, which is great. If I could just share that uh, we're, we're just so proud of our teachers. They were so empowered and they stepped forward. That was a training of teachers to other teachers. And that also is part of that process and part of the plan. Mark, you had talked about how you created a plan and you made sure everyone you know, followed it and knew where they were at with, you know, asynchronous, synchronous learning, attendance. We, we did that similarly. And we also were really transparent about it and got as much feedback as we could from all of our stakeholders. So I think that really helped things to run a lot smoother. I feel like Lisa, you and 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 uh, your partner in crime, Mark, have tag teamed this perfectly because oh. that goes into the next thing I'd like to hear from you, Marco, about being responsible for the for the whole vision of technology and 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 really looking at how how to support educators. How did you support educators bring that vision um, to life? Yeah, um, it, it 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 is a it is amazing. Um, when you have a team around you that uh, has the same vision, right? And, and you're all on the same page. And that's what we have here in Valley Stream. And so um, the PD training, obviously we spoke about the, the um, ability to have my team, which consists of two, teach, uh, two uh, tech teachers, 
one teacher assistant for tech and a network guy. So, so we have th roughly three people to kind of go around three school buildings basically and assist teachers in the classroom um, as they're teaching prior to their teaching so that we, we create the schedule where certain teachers will have um, the, te the technology teacher for about a half hour or so um, on our, on our, on their cycle, on their schedule. Um, in addition to that, they have all their prep time and prep work prior to before that lesson or before that, um, hey, I don't know how to use this. Can you help me with that conversation takes place? Um, so we, we, we make them readily available for the classroom teachers, um, even 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 the AIS teachers, the resource te room teacher, the, the English, uh, the reading teacher, the math teacher, whatever the case may be, whatever subjects being taught, um, being accessible, and having them communicate directly to the teacher, um, not just via email or, or chat um, in person if possible. Um, and as things start to loosen up, um, having those meetings together, training one another, the key training is probably one of the most important things we've um, kind of our, our plan, not just coming in doing technology with the kids, but training the teacher in that process as well. The key the, and, and turnkeying that is huge for us. And every teacher almost becomes that tech teacher in their own way and at their own time and at their at their the level of progress. So connecting all that together, watching the level of each teacher and, and speaking with the principals who are, are are a huge part of this as well, where they will come to me and ask for, all right, we get specific training here. What what focuses for this group of teachers? Um, we're, we need help in this area. So they're, 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 we're constantly in communication and understanding that the plan that we have in place that we've all created and we have that set goal in our mind and to get to the finish line, it's going to take everyone to work together to get there. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah, go on, Lisa. Can I add to that a little bit? Um, we also really strong, our vision is for global connections and for local connections. So we have three buildings in our district. And so we wanted our students to talk across those three buildings. We wanted our students to talk globally to other classrooms. And when this happened, everyone was like, oh, no, that's going to end now. But we had such a strong vision and everyone shared so much. We have like the I3 Learn Hubs, the large ones in our hallways, all three buildings. So we can make those connections in the classrooms and in our hallways with other buildings, whether it's in our own community or it's globally. And so that, that's helped us as well because we've had showcases and our teachers actually from the training from the technology team and their vision have stepped up and have training each other and they want more. So yeah, that, that's it's 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 so true. And that, that whole concept, right, of like differentiated and individual learning doesn't just apply to our students, but very much right. also to us as adults. And 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 I think that that part is often missed when we go. Okay, well, we'll 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 help the students with this, but the teachers sort of get forgotten about, or the adults. Right. Um, and I know Chris, in your role, you you you're like at the leading edge of a lot of technology development, especially you know when it also comes to to classroom technology. And and I know that you're very very strong on the whole uh, concept of possibilities and 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 how possibilities can get created. So I wonder if you've got a little bit to add on that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I'm going to comment on the video. Um. You know, I, of course, come from the technology background and, and good. I like to say good technology is like magic. You know, it just happens. You don't really know what's happening. But if I look at that video where you have an iPad communicating with an i3 screen, everyone thinks, oh, that's just simple. But you've got an iPad, which is Apple, compressing video in a certain way that Apple likes to compress the video. Then they're going to send it wirelessly on an open standard that a company like Intel has to be involved with to figure out how it's communicated. Then it goes to an i3 computer, which does in a flat panel display that does not recognize or, or is unable to process that video. So the computer's got to take the Apple, it's got to decompress it, and then recompress it and send it to your flat panel display to, to present in a fashion that understands it. And you want that all without that little stutter time buffering thing. So that's the magic that goes beyond it. That's the, a lot of the, you know, some consider boring stuff behind the scenes that we're doing. But from a possibilities thinking, you know, one of the things that I, I think people aren't internalizing yet is that now that we're one, we're digitizing all the material, which opens up a world of possibilities. But when we talk about hybrid learning now, we've introduced a camera and, and a camera comes with some interesting possibilities, some good, some bad. 
but think about it um think about it this way and, and i'm gonna you know i'm gonna allude to china in some of these discussions china is probably the biggest users of cameras in classrooms but they use it in some cases that you know most people on this call would consider it intrusive but there are areas that we can learn from that i think are really exciting so think about a a class in china they will have a um a video camera there actually they oftentimes have multiple video cameras in the screen and say it's an hour-long class the teacher can finish their class up and then they can go have a they'll literally have a board um or a data or metadata that they can look at and say you know what your class was super engaged for the first 15 minutes of that class but the last 40 minutes they just dropped what happened was it was it you know the lesson plan was too long was my pedagogy in the beginning or the materials in the beginning very good and then it fell off because on each of their videos they have what we call engagement sensors so they use analytics to look at faces and i could look at the way they move this way if they're looking at their cell phone i know they're not distracted mm -hmm. if they're hanging their head this way they're not interested but if you're basically keeping your head stable and going 45 i pretty much know you're engaged so they use engagement sensors happy sensors so a teacher can finish a class and it'll say, wow, the first 30 minutes, my class was happy. The second 30 minutes, they were sad. They were not engaged. They were mad, that type of stuff. Pretty interesting stuff and very powerful for how you how you can build your classroom materials in the future. And that's all possible with built-in anonymity. You don't have to say, wow, Chris wasn't paying attention or Mark wasn't paying attention or Wolfgang. You can just say 20% of your class wasn't paying attention, 30% was paying attention. They also use it for attendance. So from a classroom management perspective, they don't go in there and spend, are you here? Are you here? They literally will use some um, facial recognition capabilities to say all 25 students are here. You know, they will do that. Other things they do is, you know, once you build in that, um, that camera or the, re they may record it. Now they may not show the teacher's face in the recording, but they may have an audio recording along with the, uh, the presentation materials that you present on the flat panel display. And then the students can go after class and say, um, say Mark was teaching uh, math and he, he was teaching about the quadratic equation. A student can go and say, you know what? I don't understand that concept. Um, I got to go back. They can literally go online, find Mark's math class, go in, and then they, they, they do voice to text. And they could do a search for every time Mark said in his class quadratic equation. And they can go back and sync up the, what he said about quadratic equation along with the material that he said about quadratic equation. And think about that for history. You know, you could pull up everything like that. And I think that could be done in, in, in areas that are sensitive to privacy as well. You know, for example, children on video, that's, that's something that's a no-no in a lot of places. You know, at Intel, we build, you know, they're literally called head and shoulder detectors. They'll sense where humans are. And I can just blur the face. Like the background here is blurred. For any child that happens to show up, I'll just blur their faces. So it's complete privacy. If there's any recognition that they do in China, and I don't think U.S. is going to do that. I don't think Europe's going to do that. But it could be done right on the i3 device, and any images can be deleted right away. So it doesn't send a picture of Chris O'Malley to the cloud where you're, you're worried about safety. It literally says Chris O'Malley on the edge. Then it deletes that, and it, the, the only thing the cloud has is Chris O'Malley was in class. So there's ways to do that. But once you bring that video into classroom, all of these capabilities are brought to bear that I think you're gonna to start to see over the next few years. What we have to figure out is how it's done, what helps the teachers, what is not intrusive, that's a problem from a privacy standpoint. And we could together need to figure out what's the best use case for that. Do we wanna use it? Do we not wanna use it? But the capabilities exist. Yeah, really, really, really excellent point. And I know Chris, um, we chatted both, both here sort of on the side a little bit, but also previously about equity and quality also being a major part and struggle, of course, throughout the last um, 20 months, well, for much more than the last 20 months, but they've become much more prevalent than the last 20 months. And uh, interesting that you mentioned China, because in my previous role, I did work for a, for a school in China, and we had about 100 different nationalities that suddenly flew all over the world back to their homes and, and, and safety to a certain re regard, because they had to. And, and we really did struggle at times to make sure that, that students had um, equal and equitable access to the lessons we were trying to provide. We needed to really very quickly balance the, 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 that, that sort of game between um, synchronous and asynchronous instruction. How do we not lose touch with students? And, and of course, that's more the online, fully online world. But then um, very soon after, students who were still in China could come back. And, and we still had our international students who, who couldn't. And, and then we were faced with this in difference uh, within a hybrid teaching environment. So um, it's great that to see that Intel's working on these things and also the solutions with, with making um, uh, camera development and computer interaction and the whole 
educational solutions world work much better together to offer a more um, authentic uh, learning experience because that's really something that that I think um, has been missing quite a bit. Um, so, Mark, look, we we you know from from a not not to dominate this, but from a from a global perspective, you work with a with a lot of schools around the the world, and I think. Um, our our view is, as, as has been demonstrated in the comments, fantastic, by the way, to have such an array of, of international um, uh, audience. Tell us a little bit about your observation in terms of how this compares to schools around the world and other geographies. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much uh, again for the opportunity to share. I, I think Chris um, hit uh, on, on two sort of really key issues there um, and, and things. Because you know, if, if you think about schools in China, I've worked with some schools in Shenzhen, for example, and, and we, we see these sort of things mirrored, actually, in other geographies from around the world. And it goes back to another point uh, I've, I've made and, and others have sort of shared during our conversation around equity as well, because if you, if you sort of compare the sort of state markets uh, to, to your independent markets, there's a real mismatch of equity. I remember working in this one school, sort of 70 students in one classroom. And it's amazing that um, you know, the, the software is available to um, recognize and um, uh, track engagement. And I think that's really useful on, on professional learning fronts as well. As a teacher, you want your student to be engaged on, on task and, and those sort of things. So, uh, as a reflective practitioner, I think that's really exciting. Uh, um, uh, obviously, you know, some people will, will have their sort of um, worries about privacy and, and, and all those sort of things. But you know, if, if the anonymi uh, anonymization is, is there and facilitative, I think that's really, really quite useful. But again, it goes to that level playing field because not all schools have the same access to the technology. And sometimes it's not even the technology in the schools. It's, it's what children have access to when they're actually then learning and, and being supported from home. It's all very well and good doing things like you know, giving children equipment such as an iPad or a laptop or a Chromebook or whatever. But what I mean, Mark mentioned before about upping the bandwidth within the school setting, what about the bandwidth at home? You know, some, some families don't even have actual broadband. So how can you provide support on that sort of front? So, again, there's a real disparity. But some of the exciting things uh, I think I've been seeing lots and lots of are these platforms where things like live transcription take pla take, takes place. Mark, meant, uh, sorry, Chris mentioned it in his bit there. And, and platforms like Teams, you know, auto transcription, get onto Microsoft Stream and you can search for the keywords. How fantastic is that, you know? How many times do you spend time looking through and trying to find the right bit in a video? Well, well when you've got the trans the transcript there, um, even if it's not perfect, because it isn't often perfect, is it? But it will pick up those key those, those key words, and so I think that's really really helpful. And I've seen that being used lots and lots in schools, particularly when you're thinking about actual um, the ability to be because sometimes for for for, for um, you know rec illness, recovering from COVID, and all these different things. When learners come to go back into those things, the fact that the technology has facilitated those recordings, it means that students can then, a term that's really banded around an awful lot here in the UK and, and around the world as well, it's this idea of, of catch up and lost learning. Well, if you've recorded that learning and you've got the transcripts available to you, then why not get in there and, 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 get, and find what you've actually missed? So, I mean, I, I did quite... It, it didn't go, very, don't go down very well with Microsoft when I shared this back uh, sort of uh, two, three years ago when they were sort of trying to push teams into schools. And I, I, I said that um, you know, teams wasn't fit for education, um, which, as you can imagine, didn't go down very well when I said it publicly. But, you know, hats off to Google and, and, and to Microsoft and, and, and Intel and others who have rapidly at scale, you know, really transformed the products that they got available to schools because without it, I don't think schools would have actually survived. And, and, and that's something which has really leveled up the whole experience for people, whether you're in an independent school, whether you're in, in, in a state, state school, all of that. So yeah, lots of commonality, uh, uh, similar issues around equity and access and those sort of things. But it's been fantastic to see the, the levelling up. And, and alongside that, actually, the, the levelling up of teachers and their professional learning. You know, there's that Plato quote, isn't there, about... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, trying to get it right here, I'm terrible at it, but uh, necessity is the mother of, of, of invention. And so it, it was absolutely necessary that the teachers who may be a bit reticent or lacking in confidence around this, of, you know, um, I, I remember my children, and I'm sure you've had you know, your experiences yourself as parents yourself, with children on a journey saying, well, are we nearly there yet? I felt like that with technology and education for 20 years. Are we nearly there yet? And actually, for the first time in, in my professional career, I really think we are getting close to being there. 
Uh, and it's been, I think, the whole leveling up of, of, of development with software and tools uh, and, the, and the confidence of staff using technology uh, has been fantastic. But what we, I think we need to be mindful of, uh, thinking about these things strategically and technically, and is how do we maintain and sustain that momentum now that things are starting to open up and, and uh, we're starting to uh, see that the, the pandemic as being a more endemic, you know? So that, that's, that's what I'm looking for, really. Yeah, and I've just um, I've just highlighted one of the comments um, from from our YouTube channel. Quite right, I think the mitigation of loss of learning is so important right now. And 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 I mean, we're all talking about this, right? The learning that's been going on over the last twenty months and and longer. And and the, are we nearly there yet? You know, we we've suddenly gotten much closer to being there, as you've said, in a very very short period of time. Um, so now, how do we how do we make sure that that learning and that that momentum isn't lost? Um, which which brings me on to something that I've never successfully fully been able to answer. So I'm, I'm going to try and get it from you, Lisa and Mark. Um, you know, that that whole concept of um, ed tech in the classroom, um, how how can we possibly like what 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 methodologies do you use? What methods and, and, and other ways do you use to track it? What what advice can you give to others and share to say this is working or this is not working, especially looking at the hybrid teaching um, times that we've just had? Maybe we'll start off with you, Lisa. So we have different apps that we use, and Mark will go into a little bit more detail about that in, in a couple minutes. And we look at the usage behind everyone, um, the programming that we have, the digital usage. We are constantly looking at different case studies. We use diagnostic assessments that get, provide us with a lot of data. Um, one particular case study that we did, we did with I3 when we first started our training, which kind of led us into this whole journey. Um, we had noticed just when we started using the I3 technology and we're able to make more differentiation possible in the classroom, so flex flexible spaces, that we were able to track actually the students, um, not only usage with the technology, but where they were at with the curriculum and the data. And we did show an increase in our ELA and math um, percentages of students at the mean that they were at, they showed tremendous um, strengths, which comes with that differentiation piece, which was allowed through you know the technology. So that's one one way. Mark uses different uh, different programs for our district, and he'll go into that right. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the different programs we have we have Go Math, we have Raz Kids. We we try to offer um, as many programs, uh, being fiscally responsible, of course, but as many programs as possible. Um, insulary or in addition to of our um, curriculum and all of these evaluate what direction the students are going right and they all kind of um, give quizzes or or meaningful data for the teacher to go back and break down through the standards through their the curriculum specifically whatever subject topic they're on so it allows the teacher to have that data hands-on in the moment which which helps us and Lisa referred to this in our overall evaluations of our um, kind of assessments we give uh, quarterly and we gives us a real big insight as to what direction to go into. Um, the data is so important and critical for the teachers at this point, this point, I couldn't imagine them teaching without it at some point because it gives them the, it, it just gives them that direction and, and it allows them to have the conversation with um, the student and the parent as to this is where we need to move forward. Uh, we can look at this and re review that when necessary, but f it's always talked about kind of go moving forward, what direction, and and those conversations are continually happening from the data. It's all it's all about collecting that data, and understanding how to collect that data, and understand that, um, and then not to get overwhelmed by all the data that that a teacher can get overwhelmed by. So it's kind of a fine line too, where you want to say, okay, let's utilize this, let's focus on that, um, but that data is critical to um pointing everyone in the right direction especially think, now oh i'm sorry especially now with the learning loss issues the data we can't get enough data we don't want our students yeah. to have any struggles so that's been very very helpful for us as we've been moving forward yeah and i'm so glad that you both talked about that because it's something that um that i've gotten really passionate about is, is the whole data piece in schools and i know we went through a, a whole um time when schools were talking about being data driven but they've actually started moving away from that and started talking about being data informed mm -hmm. and uh, and i think even though that's a it's a nuance in, in in wording it's a huge difference in mind shift because one of them you're you're literally driving your school through 
trying to achieve better data or, or changing that data to whatever better um, indicators you may have set yourself. But the other one is actually using the data to inform yourself about what's going on. So you're being preventative and 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 sort of starting to go from from roots up as opposed to being reactive and firefighting. And, and I think that's a huge difference uh -huh. um, in, in sort of that that side. And 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 I think schools are really often afraid about talking return of investment. And, and because that's often such a business term, the ROI, and, and we want to stay away from that because education is different. And, and, you know, we're talking about students and and the learning, I, th I think it's maybe not such a bad thing, especially when we start saying, okay, we need to collect better and more data to really inform ourselves, because then the return of investment becomes evident and, and you really can start building a better picture. So Chris, I mean, you, you've already um, alluded to this a little bit and talked about this a little bit, but I'm really interested to see what, what Intel is doing on that front to, to, to talk, uh, you know, what are they doing with quality assurance and consistency of access? For delivery um, at, at a global scale, I mean that's that's sort of your role. You're overseeing a huge amount of people and teams. Um, so, you, are you referencing so adequate delivery? Um, you come. Are you talking about connectivity? Yeah. So we've you know it's interesting. We we learned firsthand. So I, I'm based out of Arizona, and when we went virtual, um, I, if and if people don't know Arizona, but Arizona's got very large uh, Native American uh, reservations throughout. So we've had, in particular, the Navajo Nation. We had students that were 50 miles from their school, 60 miles from their school. We had students who didn't even have electricity. So how? So we actually worked. Um, we worked with the governor of Arizona. We set up pervasive connectivity with like private cellular networks. And for the Navajo Nation in particular, we would um, we couldn't always provide it to every house, of course. But we would set. There were boys and girls clubs. There were public facilities where we would set up in a safe spot. We, we would have connectivity there and we got devices in front of them there as well um there were even things like um you know from a student perspective we talked a lot about professional development of teachers there's a lot that students need to learn too once you do this um you know i have very technically savvy daughters and you know there were times that i'd catch them upstairs you know crying because they had to submit a document in pdf they were working on apple pages or microsoft word and they spent two hours before they came to me. It's like, how do I convert this so I can, can you know, if it's not in by 11 o'clock, the teacher's going to give me a failing grade or something like that. There needs to be things like that, make it easier to do that, because I don't think people realize that that that's everywhere. But on that connectivity front, we have a um, we have a um, a function called Next 50, where we're going around through India, through Africa, through a lot of different underserved places, Asia where we're building networks. We work with local carriers, we work with others to provide pervasive connectivity in communities and even in schools. So as we move to this digital environment, there's a lot of schools even in the US that don't have really good connectivity. So in classroom A, it's terrible. Classroom B is great. Classroom C is good. We're trying to make sure that within the school, the connectivity is spot on everywhere. The network is really fast and, and good everywhere. But then in the whole community to make sure that that is served as well too. That's something we can't solve overnight, but we're actively engaged um, throughout the world for that. Um, we just presented it. We, there's like hundreds of different places where we've done where we're literally, you know, people climbing up on, you know, telephone poles in the area and providing uh, connectivity and networks just so we can have connectivity for students that are trying to learn virtually. So we've been very, very active in all of that. I think that's that's really wonderful. And, and, and it's great to hear. I mean, we talked about how companies are really having to step up and and I think you look at you look at Intel and I think you really you guys are really taking that challenge uh, at its core and 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 gone beyond just the now and here but but really also for the future and future proofing um mark you 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 I'm sure would like to add mark Mac Anderson in this case <laughs> you'd like to add something as well I'm sure I mean you've got you've got tons of experience here as well. No, thanks again, Wolfgang, for the opportunity to share. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, follow up. I mentioned in our, in our little back channel that I wanted to add a little bit about uh, around the data conversation, actually, because um, with my sort of teacher hat on for a moment, one of the things I, 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 as part of the computing curriculum, <clears throat> I had to teach my, 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 my students was around this idea of the difference between data and information. And so one of the things that's been really lovely again to see Sure, there's plenty, lots of data being gathered and what have you, but data um, uh, without any context doesn't is, is kind of meaningless, really. What's important is to be able to give that data context. And so 
what's again been really lovely to see over the last sort of couple of years is a lot of work going on behind the scenes to use uh, sort of AI technologies to actually give that raw data some context because teachers are so time poor. Uh, using the Google reporting dashboard, uh, things like insights and teams, these are so powerful, transformational <clears throat> in, in cutting out the, 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 the teacher workload so that they can really dig deep into where misconceptions are or attendance issues are and all these different things as well. So again, things are really moving forward, but it's so useful to have this data. But if you haven't got these sort of things in place, uh, and, and I guess these webinars are sort of advisory ourselves uh, for, for, for our viewers. So you know, dig deep into what insights are available to you because again without that context of that data there's so much work you've got to do to actually make that meaningful for you as an educator or a, a, a school leader or a district leader so just to bear that in mind really there's, there's so much out there but yeah, think carefully about what context driven uh, uh, support services you've got available to you to help you uh, have that information because Again, if, if you have that information, then you're informed uh, and, and you to use that term of data informed, didn't you, Wolfgang? So if you've got the information, you can then make judgments and, and provide support, which obviously is in the best interest of the young people and families and communities we're trying to serve. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to chime in a little bit on data and um, I'm not going to do it for you here, but I, I give presentations on the data tidal wave that is coming. And you're right, Mark, data can drown you. Um, there's so much data out there that it can overwhelm you. What we're really in schools are going to have to figure out what data is important. Um, and there's 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 all sorts of like attendance data, you know, grade. There's a lot of different data out there that's important, but it's up to educators. Um, it's not up to technology companies to figure out what data is important. We can help you manage the data through AI, as you said, but AI doesn't help you unless educators come and say, this is the data that is important for the health and well-being of a student. This is what helps them teach. Then we can take that data and using AI make sense of it. But if you just look at the data, it's, I mean, think about the data growth in education just over the last year because of COVID. You have years and years and years of classroom materials that have all been digitized and now it's stored in the cloud. There is, um, you know, I'll give you my one, I'm a little bit of a tech nerd, of course I am. So there's going to be by 2025, 175 zettabytes of data stored every year. And, and, and I'm, I'm an old lawyer, so I don't know what a zettabyte is. But to give you an example, if, if you took a, um, if, if a grain of rice was one byte of data, you could fill up the Pacific Ocean 175 times with rice kernels. And that's the amount of data we're going to be producing every single year. You're overwhelmed with that data. So educators have to figure out what is important. And then they can automate that data and they can get, you know, insights, dashboards on their students and health and well-being very quickly. But if they don't do that and just start looking at the data on their own, they're done. It, it'll just overwhelm them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we had a brief discussion about uh, data coming into, you know, health data coming into into uh, more accessible hands as well. And, uh, and I went to a presentation not that long ago, um, actually like two years ago, I suppose. Now it seems not that long ago. But um, there was a, a, a person giving a keynote about having basically done a self-analysis and analyzing the data about diet and, and, and you know, uh, pre-existing conditions about genetics and so on and so forth. And being able to, I mean, there again, masses of data, but we're moving in such a much better way, I think, coming forward, being able to analyze and having um, our hands on that data. It's just, as you said, being clear about how to use that data and, and who are the people who want it and driving that. And, and, and as, as you said, educators need to be more vocal and more precise about the type of data that they need from companies and systems in order to be able to better do their job. And, uh, and um, health and safety is, is absolutely one of the key issues and, and points. You're absolutely right, Chris. Um, so, so we're coming sort of towards the end, but um, but I, I'd, I'd like to one give the the, the audience a, a, an opportunity to ask questions. So please do type them so we can get our experts to to answer them. But in the meantime, um, to our panelists, we've we've covered a, a huge amount of of, of different um, aspects of hybrid and online teaching. Um, are there are there things throughout this discussion that that have triggered something that you'd like to still add, um, talk about um, that our audience would would hopefully be uh, appreciative of, of uh, hearing still? Just go as you would like. I did see a comment in there um, about um, privacy. I think I think Chris was uh, keen to jump in and address some of those privacy concerns. 
Yeah, you know, I, from a privacy standpoint, and I referenced this when I talked video, um, and I think the same the, the same comments on privacy um, apply to what, what I said for data. You know, as educators, you've got to tell us what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Now, I'm very well versed in the rules of GDPR and how that matters. And we can use video in a classroom that is absolutely 100% compliant with GDPR. You know, remove any personal data, any any identifying data, anybody's faces, all of that stuff. So we have to figure out together what makes sense. Because you're right, technology and video can be used improperly, but it can also be used as a great tool. And I think educators have to tell the technology companies what's acceptable, what's not, how do we want to use it, how do we not want to use it, and we set those safeguards in and we build solutions with privacy in mind from the beginning not as an afterthought it's absolutely thought of from the beginning but the the other thing i wanted to say and you did ask for comments overall is you know covid has you know it's been unfortunate but it's also been a forcing function to digitize education and once you've digitized education and you've brought in screens and education i think it's pretty powerful and we've got to think about that i mean if you you know i've got teenagers they you know, I'll pull up a cell phone, you know, they've been looking at screens all their lives, the way they consume information, the way they learn thing, everything is about media consumption. I mean, they're digital natives, they understand how to use this stuff. I mean, heck, you see a five year old in front of a TV, they go up and touch it, you know, they're used to everything being taught. None of us at our age, we don't touch screens, we just we, it's just not the way it is. But now that we have, you know, video, we're actually speaking to the way a lot of kids learn. I mean, it, you know, I used to, if you walk into a classroom and there's not a screen, it's like, what the heck? I live in a world of screens. I'm a gamer at night. You know, I walk, there's a kiosk in the store. There's kiosks at the airport. Then I walk into a classroom and it's the 1970s again. I think, you know, in some sense, that's good as far as like making sure there's no distractions. But if we use media, if we use flat panel displays, if we use that for the type of stuff that really is interesting to kids, it's the way they consume information. I think we can use it as a benefit. So I think this forcing function, while as painful as it has been, long term is going to be really helpful. And I think we can make education so dynamic. The materials can be great, engaging. It opens up so many possibilities once we've done this. So the hard part is done. Now we've just got to think, how do we want to navigate our way forward? And educators have to take a role. I mean, the technology companies, we're going to enable it, but I can't tell you what needs to happen in education. I can enable it, but I've got to listen to educators for what needs to be done. Just to kind of go along with Chris was saying, children are coming in to our district, K, K through six uh, level, um, pretty well versed, right? It's in, like, like Chris said, it's in their hand. Um, so obviously one of the most important things when they were at home to get back to the kind of the hybrid um, was mon how do we monitor them with their one-to-one -one device at home, right? So there's specific softwares out there to uh, make sure the students are utilizing it the right way. And we want to make sure we're watching um, for their emotional well-being, their, the, what, you know, how are they doing? What are they looking up? What's what's going on? And that's and that's and that's given to the parents, right, when they take that device. It's like, look, we're, this is the, the school district device. We want to make sure everyone's u utilizing it the right way. So it's monitoring it, kind of protecting one another, uh, making sure students are on task, right? Because if they're when they were at home during the pandemic, they have this one 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 device all the time. Um, so the, you know you want to be um, careful because they they are so well versed in what they want and what they what they're looking for on an iPad, a phone, a Chromebook, whatever the case may be. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, and I know Mark, you'd, Mark Anderson, you'd also like to just add something briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce Chris's comments as well about um, you know um, educators letting ed techs know, uh, ed technology companies know. Um, um, we haven't shared it during this, this uh, session today, but I, I've got a part-time job, which isn't a paper round. Uh, I'm the head of education at a software company as well, and um, you know our, our products, which have been developed over the last thirty years, are only as good as they are because we develop them based upon what educators tell us they want in supporting them so if you're listening today you know please do reach out to uh, um the companies that, who, whose products you're using and let them know what you want you know they they, they should if they're, if they're worth their salt listen to you and you know, talk about it with their development team and, and and then trying to work it to try and include that functionality in there is so important to to reach out to companies uh, and like i said if they're worth their salt they'll listen to you because 
as I shared in the uh, YouTube chat, education is a force for good. And, you know, good edtech companies really do want to work with educators because we've all, a mor we've all got a moral mission, haven't we? The young people we, we, we work towards and serve, um, you know, we're, we're doing it to try and make the world a better place for all of us. So get in touch with your, your edtech companies if you've got some ideas about how to make things better would be my advice, just as Chris shared as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Right, and that unfortunately brings us to the end of a very, very quick hour. How time flies, literally, when you're having fun. Um, I hope you guys really, really enjoyed um, this uh, third episode of our series. But before we go, a couple more things. So first of all, as per every episode, we've got a we've had a competition, and this time round, it was for a i3 camera, full HD, and these are the two winners and institutions that they represent. So well done, Itzke and Yvonne. Congratulations, we'll be in touch. Um, next episode, um, which is gonna be next month, is going to be, oh, sorry, not next month, next week. Um, I, I nearly uh, went a bit too far ahead of myself there. Hybrid teaching, but this time from a teaching and learning perspective. So more from the educators on the ground because we've, we've had a lot of the, the technical and the district and, and uh, administrative overview. So next week, we're gonna dive into the more classroom and um, uh, environment like that, which I think would be a very good addition to what we talked about today. From a company's perspective, I am so excited to share with you not quite yet what's coming next, but next week we have a big major announcement um, in the world of technology and what we've been doing over the last few months. Um, so please do watch out for that announcement. It'll be very exciting. Um, and that brings me to the end of today's show. Thank you very much to all our panelists, Mark Anderson, Mark Honorato, Lisa Conte, and Chris O'Malley. Thank you very much, and have a good night, morning or afternoon. <laughs>